Welcome to The Found Records. I am your host, Jessica Ville, and this episode is going to be just a little bit different, but not too different, because The Found Records is dedicated to telling history as it happened and not as we hoped it happened. But I really felt this episode was necessary now more than ever with the upcoming elections, because there is a dangerous level of propaganda swirling the internet on both sides, and we absolutely have no idea who our presidential candidates really are because there are so many lies being dispelled, not just by other creators, not just by fanatics, but by the actual parties themselves. I'm literally in real time watching the Republican page and the Democrat page completely inflate or just straight up misinform people about the opposing candidate. And I find that incredibly dangerous. And I just wanted to create a video or a podcast episode where people can come and listen with zero propaganda attached and make an informed, educated decision on who they want to vote for this, this election based on the candidate that best aligns with their goals for this country. So, uh, I know that politics can get a little bit overwhelming, so I'm going to try my hardest to break this episode down very cleanly. We're going to do it in sections based off of very popular hot topics. We're going to talk about how each president has handled the previous hot topics. We're going to actually go through the four years of Trump and the four years of Biden, what they have accomplished, uh, what, what they haven't accomplished, what they failed, as well as what their future vision for the next four years are going to look like. So we're going to end the video on a Trump versus Biden campaign uh, list of what they wish to accomplish this next presidential run. So we're going to go ahead and start off with one of the hottest topics that I have been seeing swirling around, and that is the topics of the border. Now, before we go into Trump versus Biden on the border here, I really, really want to educate people on why open borders are not okay. I have seen a lot of people have this opinion, a very uneducated and dangerous opinion that we should all have open borders without understanding our own personal human history and where there were times where borders actually cause a downfall of an empire or of a country. So I'm going to start off before we get into, you know, that I want everybody to be on the same page about why open borders are actually very, very not okay. So it it, is a lovely sentiment. It's a lovely sentiment to share a space altogether, but it's just not feasible. And we do have to be realistic at times. So instead of me giving my own personal opinion about it, I'm going to actually give you historical instances in which open borders have caused the downfall. So we're going to go ahead and start off with the 4th to the 5th centuries AD. This was the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And by the way, I'm going to be reading off of my notes. This is 23 pages worth of information, eight years of presidential information regarding bills and policies. I'm not going to be able to memorize it all, and I refuse to paraphrase anything and might accidentally say something out of context or just plain incorrectly. So I will be looking at my phone a lot through this. So please be forgiving. Please be easy on me because I just want to make sure you guys get the right information. So if I, if you see me on my phone, it's just my notepad full of information. So in the fourth and fifth centuries AD, there was the fall of the Western Roman Empire. This was a migration period. Large scales of migrations of various groups, such as the Visigoths, the Huns, and the Vandals, into the Roman Empire contributed to its decline. The inability of the Roman government to manage these migrations and integrate these groups led to social, economic, and military disruptions. Then you can fast forward to the 13th century, the Mongol invasions. The expansion of the Mongol Empire under Genghis Khan and his successors involved massive movements of Mongol troops and people across Eurasia. These invasions caused widespread destruction and significant demographic and political changes in regions such as China, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. Then we fast forward to the 14th century, which was the Black Death. This is actually a great example of the Uh, biological dangers of open borders. The spread of the Black Death was facilitated by the movement of people and goods along trade routes, including the Silk Road and maritime routes. While not a case of intentional migration, the lack of effective borders to control the spread of the disease led to catastrophic population declines 
and social upheaval across Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Then let's fast forward to the 15th and 17th centuries, which was the European colonization of America. The arrival of European settlers in the Americas led to the displacement and decimation of indigenous populations. That is our own history right there. The introduction of new diseases combined with warfare and the imposition of European systems of governance and economy caused immense social and demographic chaos for native peoples. And then we've got the earliest, which is 19, or the latest, 1947, the partition of India. The partition of British India into India and Pakistan led to one of the largest mass migrations in history with an estimated 10 to 15 million people crossing the new borders. The lack of effective control and planning led to widespread violence, chaos, and the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. And we're seeing this in real time again now in specific places such as Scotland and, of course, Britain, which just seems to be the one that's really going through it. And then, of course, we have the fentanyl crisis. It is increasing dramatically. The importation of illegal fentanyl across the borders is killing thousands of people. And this is coming from other countries. So there are a lot of concerns when it comes to uncontrolled illegal immigration. That is why legal immigration should always be something we should advocate for. It should be something that should be a little bit more simpler. Uh, so we should advocate for the system to be a little bit quicker with legal immigration because immigration does positively benefit a society when it is governed and controlled. So we can allow the people who are ready to better the country in and join us. So I just really wanted to give you guys that perspective so that way when you hear the upcoming information, it makes sense and you're able to process it a little bit clearer. So now that we understand that uncontrolled borders, open borders are catastrophic, let's talk about which president supports open borders. And the answer to that is actually neither of them. Uh, Biden has actually increased border personnel. He advanced surveillance technology. He improved infrastructure and he combined stringent border security measures with efforts to create legal pathways to migration. So he has verbally stated that he does not support open borders. Trump also has the exact same sentiment. Trump built the border wall. He created the zero tolerance policy, which he later fixed. Asylum restrictions, travel bans from predominantly Muslim countries. That's kind of controversial because it was a specific religion. Public charge rule to ensure migrants were self-sufficient to apply for green cards. And he also enhanced enforcement. Now, even though both presidents have verbally stated that they do not support uncontrolled or open borders, there is only one president in this equation that has failed to do so, and the party itself has actually uh, incentivized illegal immigration. So, under Trump's presidency, the total uh, illegal immigrants that have crossed the, port the border was 851,508. Now, Biden had a total immigration of 9.5 million. So that's almost 10 times the amount of people. I also want to note that the Democratic Party has illegal immigrant incentives in New York and California, such as temporary free housing, free loaded debit cards, and free food in New York City. AB 1840, known as the California Dream for All Program Eligibility, is a bill proposed in California by the Democrats aimed at expanding eligibility for the California Dream for All Program. This program is designed to assist first-time homebuyers, including undocumented immigrants, by providing financial support such as loans to help them purchase homes in America, which a lot of people have expressed concerns over because a lot of U.S. citizens aren't getting the same perks. They're also trying to enact the Non-Citizen Voting Rights Act. In Washington, D.C., the Non-Citizen Re Registration Application is a unique program designed to involve non-U.S. citizens in local governance and civic life. It allows non-U.S. citizens to register for a specific type of participation, particularly in local advisory neighborhood commissions or certain local elections. 
California passed Assembly Bill 1306. This was uh, created by the Democrats, which allows individuals with certain incomplete immigration statuses to become police officers if they meet all other requirements. Now, I will defend Biden here that he did try to draft a bipartisan border bill to control the heavy illegal immigration issue. But unfortunately, in the bill was the Ukraine aid asking for more money for Ukraine, as well as there was an issue with how much power the president would have had over the border. And the definition of overwhelming wasn't clear enough to pass this bill. So the Republicans all unanimously voted against this bill because of the vagueness and because of the Ukraine money that was being asked for within the border bill. Uh, Trump did come out and make a statement and said, I secured the border without a bill in Nevada. So that's the conversation between the Democrats and the Republicans. That is what they believe in versus what they're actually doing. And that gives you a perspective on which party, if you, you know, agree or disagree with any of it, you could see which party aligns with your agreement or disagreement. So let's go ahead and move on to the topic of gay rights. So uh, let's start off with Biden here on gay rights. He's done amazing things for the LGBTQ plus community. Biden has directed U.S. agencies to promote and protect the rights of LGBTQ plus individuals worldwide. This includes efforts to combat criminalization protect asylum seekers, and promote diplomatic efforts to advance LGBTQ plus rights globally. He also created the American Rescue Plan Act in 2021. This legislation includes provisions that benefit the individuals, such as expanding access to health care and economic relief. While this bill specifically isn't aimed only to the LGBTQ plus uh, community, it does include them in the verbiage. He has also appointed several LGBTQ plus individuals to prominent positions within his administration, ensuring diverse representation and addressing issues important to the LGBTQ plus community. Under Biden's administration, various federal agencies have taken steps to protect LGBTQ plus rights. For example, the Department of Education and the Department of Health and Human Services have implemented policies to protect LGBTQ plus individuals from discrimination in education and in healthcare. He has also reversed the Trump-era ban on transgender individuals serving openly in the military, allowing transgender people to enlist and serve without fear of discharge due to their gender identity. Now, I couldn't really find any inherently bad or anti-LGBTQ plus from Biden, though he did have a history of a little bit of homophobia, saying that he did not support uh, same-sex marriage during his run as VP with Obama, So he did have a different stance in the past. He was against LGBTQ plus and same-sex marriage being legalized. But, you know, people grow, people change. And since then, he has done positive things for the community. Now, some people do express that oftentimes LGBTQ plus protections were seen as compromised or deprioritized in negotiations. Some advocates worry that LGBTQ plus issues could be sidelined under Biden in favor of broader political or legislative deals. So that's the most I could find. Now let's go ahead and move on to Trump and his contributions to the LGBTQ plus community. For the first time in 2019, Trump actually issued a proclamation recognizing Pride Month and the contributions of LGBTQ plus individuals to American society. This was notable because previous administrations had often avoided issuing this proclamation. Before his presidency, in his past, Trump made statements supporting LGBTQ plus rights and same-sex marriage. During his 2016 presidential campaign, he did express support for same-sex marriage and suggested that he would protect LGBTQ plus rights. Trump appointed some openly LGBTQ plus individuals to various positions in his administration, including Richard Grenell as actor director of national intelligence and deputy ambassador to Germany. Grenell was the highest ranking openly gay official in U.S. history in his time. The First Step Act, signed into law in 2018, December, is a criminal justice reform bill that includes provisions for reducing mandatory minimum sentences and improving conditions for prisoners. While not specifically an LGBTQ plus bill, it included language that aimed to improve conditions for all prisoners, including 
LGBTQ plus individuals. Now, I do want to say that he did do a few things that were against the LGBTQ plus community. The first thing was that he implemented a ban on transgender individuals serving openly in the military, reversing an Obama era policy. He also removed student project protections for transgender students in schools. They, he removed the rights to use the bathrooms and locker rooms corresponding with their gender identity. The Trump administration issued an executive order on religious freedom that some LGBTQ plus advocates feared could be used to justify discrimination against the community. And this was called the Religious Freedom Executive Order. And the Trump's administration's foreign policy approach to LGBTQ plus rights were very criticized for being less supportive than previous administrations. For example, there were concerns that the administration did not do enough to promote LGBTQ plus rights globally to address human rights abuses against the individuals in other countries. Now, because we're on the topic of same-sex marriage and gay rights, uh, I do want to add a little disclaimer here because this is something that I'm seeing plastered all over the internet, and that is Project 2025. This is something that even the Democrats on their page are putting on and tying Trump to, and people aren't understanding where Project 2025 even comes from and who actually supports Project 2025. Even though Trump and the Heritage Foundation, the Heritage Foundation is the creator of Project 2025, even though they have collaborated in the past and continue to be endorsed by each other, Trump has verbally stated that he does not endorse or back or have any ties to Project 2025 specifically, and it is not on his agenda as a presidential candidate as well as Paul Deans, he's a project, uh, he leads the project at Heritage, and he served in the first Trump administration. Paul, oh, Paul Dans, sorry about that, I misspoke. Uh, he emphasized that the plans were for any conservative candidate in the future. And Trump has stated verbatim, I know nothing about Project 2025 on social media, referring to the 922 page plan put forward by a group of conservatives. So the Project 2025 is a book of ideology. It is not uh, a playbook of what will occur in Trump's administration, as he currently, as of today, does not support a lot of the things in Project 2025. So this was the um, agenda that he does actually support. And the agenda that Trump is advocating for is Agenda 47. So it's not Project 2025, it's Agenda 47. And let me show you what's inside Agenda 47. Um, economic policies, he wants to focus on cutting taxes, reducing regulations, encouraging job growth. There's also topics about controlling border uh, and immigration. There's national security pages talking about strengthening the military. There's judicial appointments to actually add more conservative judges to federal courts. He also wants to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. Education-wise, he wants to emphasize school choice. He wants regulatory reform, which proposes reducing bureaucratic red tape and eliminating regulations that Trump views as burdensome to businesses. And he also has a America First foreign policy approach, including negotiation, negotiating trade deals and reducing involvement in foreign conflicts. I do want to note here that Agenda 47 does not exclusively discuss anything related to LGBTQ plus or women's rights. So on gay rights, that is overall what both sides have done during the presidential run, both positive and negative. Now let's move forward to women's rights. Biden has done a lot. He implemented since January 2021 an executive order on advancing racial equity. This order established the Equity Task Force and required federal agencies to incorporate equity into their policies and programs. This has led to various agency actions aimed at reducing disparities. Biden has also uh, did an executive order on preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. He implemented this in January 2021. This order reinforced non-discrimination protections and has influenced political cha or policy changes in areas such as healthcare and education. There's also the American Rescue Plan again. He passed and signed that in March 2021. 
It's been fully implemented, providing economic relief that included support for child care, direct payments to families, and expanding paid leave benefits. There's also Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. He passed and signed that into law in November 2021. It has been implemented to some extent with funds allocated to child care facilities and infrastructure projects. However, the full impact will unfold over time as various provisions are executed. Then there's the National Strategy on Gender Equity and Equality. Released in October 2021, while not a law, it has guided federal actions and agency policies related to gender equity. Implementation is ongoing through various federal programs and initiatives. Now, in terms of negatives, what has he done against women? There has only been two things that I could find. So he did limit action on paid family leave. While the Biden administration has supported paid family leave, comprehensive federal paid family leave legislation has not been actually enacted, as well as the handling of campus sexual assault. The administration has made efforts to address campus sexual assault but there has been ongoing debates and criticisms about the adequacy of these measures and how they align with protecting survivors. Now let's go ahead and move over to Trump's side. So the Trump administration actually worked to support women entrepreneurs through initiatives such as expanding access to capital and promoting business opportunities. For example, the administration supported programs aimed at helping women-owned businesses access funding and resources. Women in the military, the Trump's administration supported increasing opportunities for women in the military, including expanding roles and combat positions available to female service members. The First Step Act signed into law in December 2018, this criminal justice reform included provisions that had impacted or that had an impact on women in the criminal justice system, such as improving conditions for female inmates. We have already kind of discussed that. That's another angle of it that it also does protect women. Anti-trafficking efforts. The Trump administration took steps to address human trafficking, which includes efforts to protect women and girls from exploitation. This included supporting measures to enhance law enforcement efforts and increase funding for anti-trafficking programs. Global women's issues. This administration supported global initiatives aimed at promoting women's rights, including advocacy for women's empowerment in international settings. Now let's talk about the negatives when it comes to women's rights and the Trump administration. He did roll back on a lot of reproductive health protections. The Trump administration rolled back various regulations related to reproductive health and overturned, er, sorry, there's so much, overturned Roe v. Wade, handing the decision on abortion rights to the states instead of being federally controlled. Protecting the Unborn Act. Trump has endorsed various pieces of legislation aimed at restricting abortion, including the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act, which seeks to ban abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy based on the argument that fetuses can feel pain. The Trump administration did suspend the rule requiring employers to report salary data by gender, race, and ethnicity, which was part of the efforts to address the gender pay gap. And this action was aimed at reducing regulatory burdens, but was criticized for potentially reducing transparency. ACA changes. Efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act included attempts to dismantle provisions like the contraception mandate. Although the ACA was not fully repealed, various changes were made that impacted women's health coverage. So those are the things that were heavily criticized by Trump. Some people find those positives. Some people find those negatives. It really depends on what your personal beliefs are when it comes to abortion. So take that for what you will. But those are what both candidates have done for women's rights and against women's rights during their presidential run. Now I want to move on to the topic of children because children are very important in this country. We're going to go ahead and leave with Trump this time. So first off, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. Changes to school meals. The Trump administration made changes to the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, which governed school nutrition programs. These changes included reducing some of the nutritional standards established by the previous administration, which was argued to offer more flexibility for schools. The opioid crisis. There was funding and initiatives in place by the administration allocated 
to address the opioid crisis, which indirectly impacted children as well, by supporting programs for substance abuse prevention and treatment. ACF, the Trump administration continued to support programs aimed at preventing child abuse and neglect. Funding and oversight for child welfare programs were maintained. <clears throat> Federal Commission on School Safety, established in 2018, this commission was created to assess and recommend measures for improving safety in schools. It was part of the response to the Parkland shooting here in Florida. I'm from Florida, by the way. <laughs> Increased funding. The administration supported increased funding for school security measures, including the installation of metal detectors and other security infrastructure. Now, there was one controversial policy, and it was the family separation policy. It was controversial because it initially was focused on the zero tolerance policy on illegal immigration, which led to the separation of children from their parents at the U.S.-Mexico border. That was a really big deal. Those were the children in cages movement issue. This policy faced significant backlash, and Trump eventually did sign an executive order in June 2018 to end family separations and prioritize family reunification. Administration for Children and Families, um, he, the Trump administration continued to support programs aimed at preventing child abuse and neglect, and human trafficking focuses. The Trump administration emphasized combating human trafficking, including initiatives to improve law enforcement efforts and support for victims. The administration worked on enhancing partnerships between federal and local agencies to address trafficking issues. Now let's go ahead and move on to Biden and his contributions to the children. Again, the American Rescue Plan does cover uh, children is a stimulus that include provisions that indirectly support children by providing financial relief to families, improving access to health care or sorry, child care and supporting other family related services. Proposals. While comprehensive federal paid leave was not enacted for families, Biden has proposed and supported measures to improve family leave policies and paid sick leave, aiming to provide better support for working families. So he does support that. School meals. The administration has supported programs aimed at improving access to nutritional meals. This was the famously called SNAP program. It was a, a school meal program. Increased welfare found funding. The Biden administration proposed increased funding for child wel welfare services, including efforts to support foster care systems and improve services for at-risk children and families. This one is based off of your personal belief it is a positive and or negative oops sorry and or negative depending on what side you are on on this topic but he did uh have gender affirming care for children protected protection of access to gender affirming care enforced of title IX protections for transgender students and guidance to ensure supportive school environments president biden supports and advocates for access to gender affirming care for minors his administration has reinforced protections under existing laws, opposed restrictive state legislation, and supported health care policies that include gender-affirming treatments and surgical transitions. I do want to note that the only odd thing that I could find when it comes to Biden and children, I wouldn't necessarily say this was Biden per se, but the Democratic Party rather, the Democratic Party voted unanimously against Colorado Bill 24 1092 was a house bill which was drafted by republicans to increase punishment and incarceration for child sex crimes such as human trafficking and pornography reasons it was shot down by the democrats includes that these buyers are often victims themselves that is a direct quote and were in favor of providing therapy over jail time so that's the only really major thing that i could find against him in that case but other than that that is everything he implemented during his run now let's take a look at the economy the economy um i think we can all kind of feel the differences there but i'm just going to give you your percentages so you could kind of visualize the changes and i do want to discuss also covid and how that impacts our numbers um so here are the official annual unemployment rates from the u.s borough of labor statistics bls for the year 2017 to 2023, just keep in mind which years were Trump and which years were Biden. In 2017, our annual unemployment rate was starting off at 4.4%, so that was Trump's first year. 
In 2018, it went down to 3.9%. In 2019, it went down to 3.7%. But then in 2020, when COVID came, that was risen to 8.1%. Then after COVID in 2021, it went down to 5.4%. In 2022, it went down to 3.6%. And in 2023, it is uh, at 3.5%. Now, let's talk about GDP growth. GDP growth from 2017 to 2023 in percentages. 2017, 2.4%. 2018, 2.9%. 2019, 2.3%. 2020, negative 3.4%. 2021, 5.7%. 2022, 2.1%, and 2023, it is still at 2.1%. So our GDP growth is much lower now than when Trump was in office. And our annual unemployment rates are lower now than when Trump was in office. Now, let's look at... Oh, it's starting to rain. The Consumer Price Index... Let's look at the annual inflation rates uh, starting from 2017 to 2023. The annual inflation rates read as follows, 2017, 2.1%, 2018, 2.4%, 2019, 1.8%, 2020, 1.2%, that actually surprised me a little bit, 2021, 4.7%, 2022, 8.0%, that surprised me, and 2023, 4%. So our inflation has been higher under Biden's than it was under Trump's. Let's look at stock market and investment. Uh, Donald Trump's stock market performance, the stock market saw significant gains during most of Trump's presidency with major indices reaching record highs before the pandemic. In Joe Biden's stock market trends, the stock market would also experience volatility during Biden's term with recovery following the pandemic-induced downturn. Trends reflect border economic conditions and market responses to inflation and policy changes. Both administrations did see growth during their early years with Trump's term affected by the pandemic's economic impact and Biden's terms focused on recovering uh, and having inflation management. When it comes down to job creation, Biden's administration has seen substantial job recovery and aid growth post-pandemic while Trump's tenure included significant pre-pandemic jobs gains and pandemic-related job losses. Inflation-wise, inflation was relatively low during Trump's presidency, but increased significantly under Biden, influenced by various factors, including the pandemic and global supply chain issues. When it comes to policies, Trump's focus was on tax cuts and deregulation, while Biden was emphasizing economic relief, infrastructure, and climate investments. Donald Trump's administration had notable economic achievements before the pandemic with strong GDP growth and low unemployment. The Biden administration has overseen a recovery in job creation and a reduction in unemployment following the severe losses caused by the pandemic. And because the pandemic is an element of this, it's incredibly complex to compare. Uh, let's say that Trump gets elected this round these four years of Trump are going to be easier to compare to Biden to see which one did have the better performance. But being that Trump's numbers were just significantly better when it came to the economy, despite the pandemic, that kind of gives you an idea of like where his strengths are in that. But let's go ahead and look at the U.S. dollar as well. The U.S. dollar and its value is very, very important to look at when it comes to the presidency. So the dollar performance under Trump, during Trump's presidency, the U.S. dollar generated strengthened against, or sorry, generally strengthened against other major currencies, particularly in the early years. The dollar index, DXY, which measures the dollar's value against a basket of foreign currencies, was relatively strong before the pandemic. Inflation, inflation was moderate, averaging around 1.8% annually from 2017 to 2019, the relatively low inflation helped maintain the dollar's purchasing power. And when it came to COVID-19 impact, the dollar experienced volatility during the pandemic with a brief surge in strength in early 2020 as investors sought safe haven assets. 
However, the dollar weakened later in 2020 as the Federal Reserve implemented aggressive monetary policy to address the economic impact of the pandemic. Let's go ahead and look at Biden when it came to the U.S. dollar. Exchange rates. The U.S. dollar experienced fluctuations under Biden, influenced by global economic conditions, inflation concerns, and Federal Reserve policies. The dollar index showed variability, reflecting both domestic and international factors. When it came to inflation, inflation surged significantly in 2021 and 2022, reaching around 8% in 2022. That is, in is insane. High inflation can erode the purchasing power of the dollar, impacting its real value. The Federal Reserve's response, including interest rate heights, aimed to combat inflation and stabilize the dollar. The Federal Reserve increased interest rates significantly in response to inflationary pressures. Higher interest rates generally support a stronger dollar by attracting foreign investment. So in summary, the US dollar was relatively strong early in Trump's presidency with a stable inflation environment. The pandemic introduced volatility and weakened later in his term. And in the Biden era, the dollar has faced challenges due to high inflation, but has seen periods of strength as well particularly in response to interest rate heights, hikes by the Federal Reserve. The economic impacts of each administration are shaped by both policy decisions and external factors such as the pandemic, making, again, direct comparisons very complicated. I do want to note that Trump and the Republicans are the party that are against the central bank digital currency, and wants to remove cryptos and bitcoins coming from overseas and be USA made instead. So that is all the discussion centered around the US dollar when it comes to Trump and Biden. Now let's go ahead and talk about war. War is very important. You really have to understand where a president sits when it comes down to war. So we all know where Biden sits when it comes down to war. Unfortunately, there is the Ukraine-Russia war. Biden has been actively involved in supporting Ukraine amidst the Russian invasion that began in February 2022. The U.S. has provided substantial military aid, economic support, and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine since we are a part of NATO. Israel versus Palestine. Biden's administration has provided military aid to Israel against Palestine. So let's look at the military spending here. Um, the defense budget for Biden is approximately $768 billion for fiscal year 2022 and $847 billion for fiscal year 2023. There is also a separate military aid to Ukraine, which is over $100 billion committed by mid-2024. So if we're going to lay this out in years, Biden has spent $768 billion in fiscal year 2022 in 2023, it increased to $847 billion. And in 2024, the proposal currently as of now is $885 billion. So we're seeing an uh, increase in spending when it comes to war. Under President Joe Biden, there has been a significant spending related to international assistance and foreign policies. So let's go ahead and look under Trump's administration. Under Trump's administration, there was no initiated new wars. Military actions, the administration engaged in specific military actions, including strikes in Syria, the killing of Qazi and Soleimani, and support for existing conflicts in Afghanistan and Yemen. The ongoing conflicts, uh, the administration managed existing military engagements and conflicts rather than initiating new war. So we were still in combat, just not starting combat. So the military spending during Trump's presidency looked a little like this. So in 2018, he spent 700 billion. So that is about 68 billion, or sorry, 68 million less than Biden. 2019, it rose up to 716 billion. 2020, it rose up to 738 billion. And in 2021, it rose up to 740 billion. So he also had an upward trend in military spending. The only differences between these trends is that Trump was actually spending the money on the U.S. military equipment and upgrading the technology and the defense. Meanwhile, Biden has been spending the money in foreign affairs for Israel and the Ukraine-Russia war. Now, they did have teamwork. Biden and Trump did have some teamwork when it comes to war. This is actually a really interesting fun fact. Um, ending America's longest war, starting because of 9-11, 
The process for withdrawing U.S. troops from Afghanistan began with the Doha Agreement signed in February 2020 by Trump. This agreement with the Taliban set the framework for a phased withdrawal of U.S. troops. Upon taking office in January 2021, President Biden conducted a review of the U.S. strategy in Afghanistan, including the terms of the Doha Agreement. Biden decided to adhere to the planned withdrawal timeline, but made adjustments to the process Biden announced in April 2021 that all U.S. troops would be withdrawn by August 2021, the 31st. The final phase of the withdrawal began in May 2021, with the last U.S. troops leaving Afghanistan on August 30th, 2021. Now, the withdrawal did see significant challenges, including a chaotic evacuation and the rapid takeover of the country by the Taliban, with 13 U.S. soldiers dying during this operation. So Biden was heavily criticized for the way he chose to pull out of Afghanistan, but he pulled out of Afghanistan because of the Doha agreement that Trump signed. So that's why I call it teamwork there. All right, so we're getting pretty close to the end here. We just have to talk about taxes and then we're going to be talking about the Trump versus Biden campaign. So stick with me. We're getting a really good, clear picture of their history. And then we're going to talk about the present day and what they uh, are fighting for. So let's look at taxes. <clears throat> let's start off with Trump here. The TCJA reduced the tax rates across several income brackets. For example, the top marginal tax rate was lowered from 39.6% to 37%. There was an increased standard deduction. The standard deduction nearly doubled, increasing to 12,000 for single filers and 24,000 for married couples filing jointly in 2018, which simplified tax filing for many and reduced taxable income. There was a tax credit expansion. The child tax credit was increased from $1,000 to $2,000 per qualifying child. The income threshold for receiving the full credit was also raised, allowing more families to benefit. Personal exemption elimination. The TCJA eliminated the personal exemption, which was $4,050 per person in 2017. This was offset by the increased standard deduction and other tax benefits. Then there was the famous corporate tax cuts. The corporate tax rate was significantly reduced from 35% to 21%. This was intended to make U.S. businesses more competitive globally and to encourage domestic investment. Then there is the deduction for pass-through entities, Section 199A deduction. The TCJA provided a 20% deduction on qualified business income for pass-through entities. This would include sole proprietorships, partnerships, and S-corporations. This aimed to reduce the effective tax rate for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Then there was an increased exemption. The estate tax exemption was doubled from $5.49 million per individual to $11.18 million allowing individuals to pass more wealth to their heirs without incurring estate taxes. This is just a generational wealth tax, essentially. Uh, AMT changes. There is an increased exemption there. The TCJA increased the exemption amount for the alternative minimum tax, reducing its impacts on higher income taxpayers. And there was a deduction limit for the state and local taxes called SALT. The TCJA capped the deduction for state and local taxes at $10,000, which affected taxpayers in high-tax states. When it comes to the impact and controversy, when it comes to economic growth, supporters of the TCJA argue that the tax cuts led to increased economic growth, higher wages, and job creation. So Trump's decisions, that's what they're pretty much in support of. They're saying that these tax decisions have led to a growth in the economy. Now, the critics have concerns. They argue that the tax cuts disproportionately benefited wealthy individuals and corporations, increased the federal deficit, and did not deliver the anticipated long-term economic benefits for all income levels. So let's go and see what Biden has done during his run. The corporate tax rate increase. Biden did propose increasing the corporate tax rate from the 21% that Trump put in to 28% to fund infrastructure and social programs. However, this increase has faced significant debate and has not been fully implemented. 
Global Minimum Tax, the international agreement, Biden supported an international agreement on a global minimum tax rate, aiming at preventing tax avoidance by multinational corporations and ensuring fairer taxes, tax practices globally. Increase in top marginal tax rate. Biden proposed raising the top marginal tax rate for individuals earning over 400000 from 37% to 39.6%, this change is intended to increase taxes on high income earners. Capital gains tax. Biden proposed increasing the capital gains tax rate for individuals earning over 1 million, aligning it with ordinary income tax rates. The current proposal aims to tax long-term capital gains at a higher rate for wealthy individuals. Now, of course, there were a few um, things that they have proposed or have implemented that didn't properly in implement. That goes for both Trump and Biden, but essentially that is what they aimed at doing. Now let's go ahead and move on to the Trump versus Biden campaign. We're finally here. I don't even know how long this podcast episode is so far, but let's talk about what both parties represent, what they have an interest in. So we're going to go ahead and start off with Biden's 2024 campaign goals. He wants to strengthen the economy. Biden's economic growth, job creation, and inflation reduction is part of his plan. Climate change, clean energy transition, and climate resilience expand incentives for renewable energy sources, electric vehicles, and energy efficient technologies. Healthcare, expanding affordable healthcare, expand gender affirming care for minors and migrants. Social, let's look at the social side. This is where the two presidents really differ here. He wants to advance civil rights and criminal justice reform, expanding on DEI, which is diversity hire, supports transgender inclusion in public spaces and sports, support the rights for schools to help keep students' transitions private from others and their own parents, implement measures to address police accountability, reduce mass incarceration and support rehabilitation and reentry programs, support legislation aimed at advancing racial and gender equality and combat discrimination in various forms, increase funding for mental health services, integrate mental health care into primary care settings, and support mental health research. He also supports increased funding for child care subsi subsidies and programs, making it easier for low-income families to access affordable child care. He wants to expand social safety net programs, including nutritional assistance and family support services. When it comes to education and when it comes to workforce, he wants to increase education funding for K through 12, allocate taxes to pardon student debt and workforce development. When it comes to national security, Biden is interested in strengthening allies. So he wants to strengthen his alliance. He supports international diplomacy and humanitarian aid with a focus on regions like Ukraine and other areas experiencing conflict. He wants to continue the support for NATO and other key allies and collaborate on global security issues. This is, again, one of those things where it could be a bad thing or a good thing to you personally. Um, but he is still focused on foreign affairs uh, far more than Trump would essentially be. Infrastructure and technology, infrastructure improvement and technological innovation. And when it comes to tax policy, he wants to ensure tax fairness and funding social programs. So that is the key highlights of Biden's uh, 2024 campaign. And that goes for the Democrats in general. Now let's go ahead and look at Trump's 2024 campaign goals. Economic growth, he wants to extend tax cuts, reduce regulations, deregulate industries, and revise trade deals. He wants to propose initiatives to improve access to capital and resources for minority-owned businesses, aiming to foster entrepreneurship and economic development in minority communities. He wants to propose policies to support home ownership, including potential tax incentives and easing regulations on housing development. He advocates for reducing federal oversight and increasing local control in housing policy, which Trump argues will lead to more affordable housing solutions. Immigration reform, strengthening border security and reforming legal immigration processes. He wants to mass deport all illegal immigrants immediately and reduce visa overstays. He wants to end illegal immigrant incentives and handouts that are being given in blue states such as New York and California. He wants to remove and or lower income tax. Trump has advocated for simplifying the tax code and making it easier for taxpayers to file their returns less. 
<laughs> and for households to have more disposable income per year. And on the website for Trump, I believe it is sitting at around $4,000 estimate for every family. Once he implements his tax cut, it'll every family will see back around $4,000, give or take, depending on their uh, annual income. He has pro proposed various reforms aimed at reducing the complexity of the tax system, which could involve minimal involvement of the IRS in the future or eventual complete abolishment of the IRS. Um, he wants to use revenue from tariffs to lower and or eliminate income tax and lower corporate tax rate by 1%. Uh, fun fact, by the way, it's just a history fun fact. Uh, the IRS was actually implemented uh, during wartime as a temporary solution to uh, stimulate the economy. So the IRS was supposed to be long gone long ago. Uh, they just kept it. So we shouldn't be paying income tax along with every other tax that we have been paying. That was just a temporary thing to supplement our country at that time. Um, healthcare, let's talk about healthcare. He wants to repeal the ACA. That's a very controversial thing. Not a lot of people are happy about that and reduce drug prices to be more affordable, especially for minorities. Also, he wants to end transgender affirming care for minors. Uh, energy policy. He wants to promote USA energy independence and rolling back climate regulations. When it comes down to national security, he wants to prioritize an America first foreign policy and resolve war related conflicts, reprioritizing the American citizens concerns. When it comes to election integrity, he wants to reform election laws and address election security concerns to combat voter fraud. And when it comes to social, again, this is where they vary very differently to Biden uh, to, from each other. Uh, he wants to advocate for reforms to welfare programs. He actually wants to focus on work requirements and reduce the dependency, aiming to encourage self-sufficiency amongst low-income families. Trump will pass a bill where the only genders recognized by the U.S. will be male or female. Under Title IX, he will ban men from women's sports and protect parents from being forced to provide gender-affirming care to their children. Trump plans to cut federal funding to every school teaching critical race theory and further racial, sexual, and political content to minors. He wants to promote school choice through support for charter schools, private school vouchers, and education savings accounts. Trump argues that increased educational options will provide better opportunities for minors, or sorry, minors, minorities. He wants to oppose new gun control measures uh, advocating for the protection of the Second Amendment rights. Trump argues that maintaining these rights is important for all Americans. So you can see that where Trump and Biden really, really differ is definitely in the social category the most um, and also in the war category as well and so that's where you have to look and reflect at what you believe in for this country what you support for this country and vote accordingly uh, when it comes to voting just remember that you have the god-given right to choose whatever candidate aligns with you genuinely and wholeheartedly, not based on propaganda, not based on fear mongering. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it, sick of it, sick of it. I'm tired of both presidents being hyper inflated to be these mega monsters in which they are not. Are, are they, have they done terrible monstrous things? Yeah, depending on who you ask, actually. I feel like everyone has a varying opinion on that nowadays, but you know, they are humans and they have done good things. As you can see from my list, they have done good things in the past. Uh, you know, it, who did better is a matter of, you know, it, I don't know if you've been striking a little like uh, Trump versus Biden list, like, oh, one point for him, one point for him. I don't know if you were doing that. You, maybe you could weigh it down in the comment section, which one seemed to have done more for the country. I don't want to put my two cents in that, nor do I want to advocate for a particular candidate because I don't want to influence you guys to make any particular choice. But I hope that this podcast episode gave you a very clear and concise view of both presidents, what they have accomplished, what controversies they've experienced, and what their campaigns are moving forward so you can make an informed and honest decision when it comes to this new election. So remember that it's not just the presidential 
elections that are important. It's also your local elections. So please also pay attention to who's being locally elected. So that way your area defines and represents you and your beliefs better. Uh, and, and that's really the only way to go about it. You know, that's why there's different states. Florida is different from New York. They have different beliefs. California is even different from New York. Every state has their own belief system and their own way to run things, some better than others. And it reflects the people who live there and what they personally believe in and what might fit some people won't fit other people. It's all a matter of opinion, um, but hopefully this gave you a much more clear picture of what you will be supporting this coming um, election. And please, in the comment sections, do not bash anyone for voting either red or blue. There is no reason to be hateful and divisive. I know it, it is hard when someone disagrees with a value of yours to witness, but that is what America is about. It is about being able to think and be however you wish in the privacy of your own existence. You do not have any um, authority or priority to push your belief system on someone else who disagrees, nor should you have any place of judgment for having a different belief system that opposes that opposes the per other person. So like you really have no room to judge, no room to condemn. So whoever wants to comment, go Biden or go Trump, please just don't contribute to the division that the government is so thirsty to have because the more that we are fighting each other, the more they get away with what they get away with. They don't want a class war. They want a culture war because a class war involves them and a culture war doesn't. So be mindful of that. Again, I understand the feelings you may feel. I have personal feelings over one side more than the other. I have many times gotten irate and frustrated with what I witnessed from one side over the other, at least in this specific election. Um, as a centrist, my support for a side definitely changes based off of the candidate, not the party. So even though I feel that way, I don't want to sit here and instill my beliefs on everybody and be like, oh, this is why you should vote for who I think you should vote for. So, um, you know, this is America. We have the right to vote for whoever aligns with us. So go out, make sure you vote. It does matter. It does count every single one of them. There's also a third party. Don't forget about that option. There is Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, he is an independent. I know independents aren't very popular, but he is an option as well. So it's completely up to you. But thank you so much for tuning in to The Found Records. I really hope that this video promotes very constructive and peaceful conversation, if anything, in the comment section. And I hope that this was a helpful episode. Stay tuned for the next episode. Make sure you comment down below what you would love for me to talk about next when it comes to history. And I'll see you guys in the next episode.